some of us. <laughs> okay, well, 1400, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, for the, the last event for our IA Scholars Project Day, which is gonna be a panel um, consisting of experts from, from the CAD, specifically the ADP 313 writing team, um, as well as some uh, that are gonna be talking about the operational environment model that the Army is adopting with the FM 3-0. Uh, what I would like to do is I'm gonna kick it over to them to discuss kind of some of the progress with the ADP 313 um, writing effort. For those of you that don't know, um, I think it was re released to worldwide review in around November or December of 2021. Um, and actually, as we as the Scholars Program, we started in the, the end of, middle of December, and this was our first topic. We were immediately handed this and said, okay, your, your homework over the, the holiday is to, to review it and provide inputs. Um, so that's what we did, and that was our first task. So um, some of those comments that you guys got were from us. Um, for the, the scholars that are in the room that uh, are tracking the progress, there's been a lot of changes, so um, we're gonna kick it over to them. They're gonna be able to brief kind of the status update of the current ADP 313 and hopefully create a baseline too for those that aren't familiar with the effort of, of what the, the content really is in ADP 313 and uh, more importantly, I guess, the way it nests within FM 3.0. Um, so just kind of do some quick introductions um, so you guys can put names to faces. I'll start with you, sir, Mr. Trenkel. If yeah, I'm Chuck Trenkel. I'm the Command and Control Division Chief over at CAD. I'm right, I write uh, ADP 6.0 uh, and have been involved in information now, actually for a long time, but in the 313 since the beginning back in like February of last year. So. I'm Mike Flynn. I uh, retired infantry guy. I've been in CAD for like 18 years, I think. Yeah. So, but I am, I am the 5.0 guy. That's been my job, 5.0, and I've been helping with 3.0. But uh, I'm now part of the uh, Information Vantage team too. So, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Bell, I'm the Field Artillery Officer. I work uh, with Chuck uh, in the C2 Division. I came aboard the Information Train uh, after it had already departed the station, and. Uh, Oh, before that, I worked on the uh, FM 30 team. Pass over to Eric. Yep. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Gilge, uh, engineer officer, um, been at CAD for two years now. And the day after I got to CAD, I got my first guidance on the rewrite for FM 30. So I'm the team lead for FM 30, and. By default, um, essentially turning multi-domain operation that multi-domain operational concept into um, doctrine. Uh, so we've been working that for two years now. Um, so my piece of this, I'll be talking specifically just to the operational environment model that we developed as part of that. I actually work in the office right next to um, the team that's working on ADP 313. So we've tried to stay pretty um, tied in together because uh, they really are complementary effort, yeah. efforts. Um, and I'll turn it back over yeah, to you Yeah, we guys. stay very nested. So Eric is one of the, like, my co-division chiefs, right? So we work together. Uh, actually, Jesse, Mike, I, my, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dean, uh, and, and I were all on the FM 30 team until ADP 313 reared its ugly head, right? So, uh, th sir, thanks for having us come over here and talk. This is the agenda we're going to follow today. It's kind of a modified version of, of, of a briefing. I gave it a call lessons learned form uh, about two months ago, I guess. And I think yep. you listened to it and thought that was pretty good. Uh, so we decided to use that one. Uh, you can see what we're going to what we're going to follow. Uh, disclaimer up front is that this is all draft, right? So like what you read, you know, is really kind of changed an awful lot. Now we're not going to get into it here. We'll, you'll kind of be able to discern what direction we're headed. Uh, but until we get some decision from the CG on the 9th, you know, none of this is final. So the whole Army's moving on on this. Uh, next slide, please. Y you know, ever since I've been here for about 15 years now, uh, <coughs> first time I came to Leavenworth was 2000 uh, time frame for uh, when I was over in BCTP. 
they released a 2001 FM3 up, okay? That was a big deal uh, back then. Uh, you know, the big idea when it came to information was information superiority. Uh, and we had good discussion on ISR, information management. That was kind of the first time that idea was introduced in NIO. And the discussion there was an expansion on what had been put out in the first IO book in 1996, I think, right? So that was the kind of information superiority was the big idea. It was a big information idea back then. All right, you fast forward uh, seven years. Uh, you know, we wrote another 3.0, okay, the 2008 version of 3.0. Uh, but because of influences from General Petraeus, who kind of came here as a cap commander and thought that IO as, as described you know, in 2001, and in FM3 Turkey, it was a broken idea. He basically said, look, it encompasses such a big area and so many disparate capabilities, there's no way that like one guy we sent to FA30 school can be responsible for integrating the synchronizing of this stuff, right? So the idea that kind of came out in that book was information superiority still survived, but instead of IO, we had the Army information tasks. Uh, and if you go and look at those tasks, it basically takes all the information-related capabilities and kind of bends them underneath uh, separate headers or separate discrete tasks. Uh, in my mind, the big problem with 2008 is they never assigned staff responsibility for any of those. I know that was like the big contentious point when they were trying to get the thing published and finally just said, heck with it, we're gonna publish it, and, and away it went. All right, uh, but no I.O. in 2008, right? The Army is not using I.O. anymore. Uh, two years later, Lieutenant General, or General Dempsey takes over TRADOC. General Dempsey has a different idea uh, he does not like I.O., he does not like 3.0, he wants Mission Command, uh, and he also wants kind of this, he's written a white paper, I think, uh, on this idea that really when you were talking I.O., you were talking kind of cognitive things and technical things, uh, and what he kind of came up with, and what uh, Jeff Witzkin and also uh, uh, Mike Dominique, I think, down at the I.O. proponent came up with was this informed influence activities and cyber electromagnetic activities. So, so those were the two ideas uh, in, in change one to 2008. Uh, interestingly enough, we did not write an information superiority chapter. We did not have an information chapter in that version of the manual. Uh, so we st kind of stopped hooking or linking that to IM or to, uh, to ISR. Uh, so we had no IO. Uh, two years later, uh, General Odierno is now Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, Lieutenant General Odierno had been MNCI commander when we came up with IA and SEMA. He critically non-concurred with IA. General Dempsey said, thank you very much. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, when he was chief, he said, you can tell me that when I'm in the MNCI commander, but you can't tell me that when I'm the chief. So get rid of IA. So he came back with synchronized information-related capabilities, which was essentially IO. And by 2016, we had come full circle on information operations was the idea again, right? So four information operations ideas in like 15 years. And I personally think none of them survived long enough for anybody to really make a reasonable assessment of whether they were successful or not. Uh, the one thing that they all did, I think, was they focused on binning of capabilities, all right? Uh, so really, it was like who works for who and who's responsible for doing what. Uh, and we never really looked at the other dot mil PF, in my opinion, and that's kind of what's different now uh, about what we're doing with IA. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, so, so we've been living with I.O. again since 2016. Two years ago, uh, TRADOC kicked off, a, I think it was TRADOC, was it TRADOC or Futures Command? Kicked off a series of meetings, right? Uh, basically a campaign of learning called Waypoint 2028. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and their charter was to look and see what did the Army need to do uh, in order to have what they call an NDO capable force by 2028 and an MDO ready force by 2035. So this was like, we're gonna do all, you know, we, we looked at all kinds of stuff. You know, poor Mike got sucked into LOE5, which was information, and they looked at like, are we gonna have information as a function, and, and how are we gonna mess with all this stuff? I personally didn't care, because I had gotten away from information when I revised ADP60 back in 2019, and I kicked information to the curb, because I kept changing their stuff, and everything hateful to, uh, to me that has happened in the last 15 years has been information related. So you had the MDO concept was out there. You had Waypoint 2028. Uh, the CSA had written a couple of white papers where he introduced the idea of decision dominance. Uh, the joint folks, all of a sudden we found out about JP304, who we had, we had no knowledge that was going on. Uh, and I think that was a group of specialists that got together on the down low in DC. 
and wrote that manual and sent it out as like a final draft that because we kind of looked at it like this OIE didn't make sense and a couple other things uh, but the army ended up critically non concurrent with it that uh, at some point in time they stood up an information council colonels and started looking at that problem statement there uh, and, and in the end we had a uh, 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 the, 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 our cyber and general Fogarty uh, had a white paper and they threw out this idea originally it was going to be information warfare got told you can't have information warfare by the secretary of the army uh, turned an information advantage with these five activities they had uh, and general Fogarty sold that to general Rainey uh, we had a summit in February 2021 the decisions were made to include a new OE terminology you know the fact we're not going to use the information environment anymore and then uh, OPR and OCR responsibilities for the lines of effort uh, and so we kicked off kind of ADP 313 right after about that time with a team of like 26 guys on teams. Uh, and Lieutenant Colonel Gill has got to figure out the OE uh, issue because FM 30 and ADP 30 are the presumption of the OE, although that's kind of our linkage because we got to talk about the dimensions and the information dimension, right? So Sally, uh, Major White, has written 200 pages uh, on the debacle of the history of IO and Army doctrine. So I was scanning it before I came over here. Questions on that? Kind of how we got where we are today. Okay. Uh, I think Lieutenant Colonel Gill is yep. going to talk the OE model. So the operational environment model, um, when we started looking at this, um, this was one of the first things that we started to um, debate and look at as part of FM30. So if we're going to, the idea was that if we're going to talk about multi-domain operations, then we need to have a very clear and concise understanding of the domains so we can describe how they are interrelated and their interdependencies and so forth. So when we took this kind of back to, back to, to base principles, um, what makes something in a domain? Why, you know, there's a lot of things that were kind of being thrown out there, getting a little loose with terms is like, um, you know, as to what makes a domain. So for one of the first things we did was um, we defined what a domain is. Um, so domain, as defined in the new 3.0, would be physically, it's a, it's a defined portion of an operational environment that re requiring a unique set of warfighting capabilities and skills. So you got a maritime domain, um, you know, you need ships, you need um, uh, naval officers that know naval warfare, so you educate them for that. You got, you know, so you got the equivalent on the land with the Army, the equivalent for the air for the Air Force. Now we have the equivalent for the space for the Space Force. And though we don't have a cyber, uh, cyberspace service, we do have a cybercom, you know, are the experts there and they train on code and how you, you know, so that's how we looked at domains. But then there's a whole bunch of other things that don't really fall into that. So how do you char characterize that? The joint model, which has an operational, you know, has the, fi has the domains, they also have an uh, information environment, um, and then the, plus the EMS spectrum, and it's defined in different ways in different places, but in the new JP30, that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the bottom line. What we found is that people were misinterpreting that, that you had an operational environment, um, whether, and then you had an information environment. So you had people doing, op, you know, planning for operations and planning for information op, um, operations, and they were being stovepipe. Whether it was meant to happen that way or not, that's kind of the reality of how things were starting to starting to occur. So we wanted one, one comprehensive operational environment so that you could have one cohesive unitary operation. So everything was meant to fall under one operational environment. So then what do we do with information? What do you do with things like the human, the human element? Because people have been throwing that about around as a human domain. Um, really what, what we saw those things are is that they're cross-cutting. They apply, they're, they're, there's a part of them in every domain. So we, so we talked about aspects, we settled on the term of dimensions. So, you know, physical information and human dimensions, which are cross-cutting of the five domains. And then those just so happen to kind of match up very, correlate very conveniently with, you know, physical advantages, human advantages, and information advantages. Um, this also kind of helps put, um, and lastly, this helps put information into context because it, w there was a lot of discussions as if information in and of itself could um, win, win a fight or 
you know, was you, you, you can't talk about information without talking about the, you know, the physical elements of it. Physical, you know, with, you know um, physical destruction on a battlefield still means a lot. Um, the human element, the human dimension, as we now would say, still means a lot. Morale means a lot. Leadership means a lot. The will to fight means a lot. Recent experiences um, from what we've seen in uh, recent, recent events over the last few months just validate that those, these three dimensions and the way they interrelate, um, is, you, you can say a lot with them and describe an operational environment very effectively with the five domains and the three dimensions. That's all I got. Uh oh. I, I think the concept needs to be relatively well thought through and experimented on. Uh, and then once it is, uh, uh, you know, written, you know, in a doctrine, once it's been validated and, and we've written to it, then I think it needs to be left alone for a while, okay? Uh, a couple of years at least, uh, and it needs to be assessed and we need to get feedback on it. Uh, what I don't want is, you know, and again, there's lots of things that change doctrine. Uh, uh, you know, kind of senior leader direction is one of them, uh, and it's okay. That's you know that happens, but I will tell you, in my experience, most of the time is when things don't turn out really good. Is when we get told what to put in, you know, from higher rather than something that is kind of demand supported from the field that kind of comes out from a developed, validated uh, concept. Is that diplomatic enough? That was, that was great. This is non-attribution, right? <laughs> Hey, uh, Chuck, I just want to follow up something on that, too, though. This is also when we're making a lot of uh, force structure decisions, and, that's, and that has a direct implication on capabilities, effectiveness, and then really developing that base of knowledge in order to get practice. It seems as if we've got cart ahead of the horse, or in some cases there's no horse at all in terms of fleshing out the concepts and then getting demonstrable, not even demonstrable results, but really asking the question, you know, is this concept really marrying up with what we said, knowing full well uh, <coughs> that budget, for example, in, a, in any given year or something to that effect. And I, and I don't know where that is kind of rolled up. I mean, know in doctrine, you're kind of left in a cave to, to kind of stew, but this other piece with the combined arms center and how we roll back in things like what, uh, you know, what, what FFID would be doing or what CDIDs we used to be doing, or, or at least in terms of how that conversation occurs. Um, is that happening? And then more importantly, is there a plan in which we're saying, take an appetite suppressant, let's let this cook for a little bit? Yeah, the, there, there's no, uh, so there's a couple things there. So does anybody know what I say when I meet, say, uh, what I mean when I say the IAOPT, like the weekly IAOPT, is that, are you guys familiar with that? So, so part of this effort, all right, when this all kicked off, when, when the decision was made last February that we're going to write this book, uh, and we assigned the responsibility for these lines of effort that the three stars decided the lines of effort were going to be, uh, we kicked off a, a it actually is twice a week teams meetings, okay? Uh, and that was designed to do the rest of the OTML PF. Uh, and so we were simultaneously developing doctrine and doing the rest of the .mil PF assessment at the same, you, you know, analysis, I guess, at the same time. Uh, I hate the term building the airplane in flight, you know, that's kind of old fashioned, or yeah, it's an older term, uh, but that's exactly what's going on right now. Uh, you know, there's not really a validating concept out there. This was a good idea. This was based off a white paper uh, uh, that was published, you know, a four page white paper that came out of our cyber. Uh, and you know, after a certain point in time, the dis once we had a draft done, people got told, use the draft, okay? So use that draft to drive the work that you're doing in these IAOPTs, uh, and, and now we're gonna change that up on you. And I don't know how flexible a system's gonna be, you know, I don't know how well, received, how well that's gonna be received when it finally gets out there, because uh, the Army's done an awful lot of work using five lines of effort and, and some things we wrote in this book, but 
you know, we caveat it the whole time. It's like, this is going to change. It's a draft. We got 2,000 comments. Mike's going to talk about it a little bit. We got big issues and things. You're going to have to be flexible enough to change. Um, I know that they're going after stuff in the pond, like right now. You know, and I mentioned earlier, they're going for like 195 folks to build three theater information advantage elements. And they have three MDTFs, I think, in this next one. Uh, and that's kind of an information related deal. Uh, but, plus but staff, uh, G, yeah, plus G39, G39, G39 at like expansion Division and core. Um, and, yeah. and, uh, so those are all like FDUs and things that are cooking out there. But, you know, I hear, I hear the TRAOC people say one thing on these meetings. And then, like, like the Army G8 will be like, well, where's your concept? Where's your justification? What makes you think you're going to get 195 people to do this? I just think it's, I think it's going to be really ugly here in the next couple of months. I think there's, so we'll see, you know, and, and, uh, and I will tell you that, uh, like I said earlier, the one thing I think has been different has been the, the rest of the dot mil TF work we've been doing. Like if we don't do that, if we don't actually don't follow through on that, and when they're talking army 450, you know, and the fact PAO doesn't traditionally compete well in the palm, I, I, it's, it's just going to, this idea will be the fifth one up on that second slide, right? It will be the fifth idea in, in like 20 years. To me, success is like get rid of two IBCTs and buy, you know, the public affairs, the civil affairs, you know, rebalancing compo, get more MISO dudes, the cyber. You know, all the guys we say we need uh, to do this stuff to be like an information age army. But I just don't see it happening, quite frankly. So, sorry. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to refrain from asking my question now, but I'm going to let you know that I'm going to ask you a bombshell question about culture at the end of your brief, <laughs> and I'm preemptively letting you know. Okay. I'll let Jesse answer that. No, not in this particular case, okay? Army, I think Army, I don't think so. Army Futures Command has a fairly good process in place. Uh, not only on the degree of the stuff they can put out there, uh, but they get to a point where they, you know, they've actually thought about it, they've experimented on it a bit, they've done some validation, and then they throw it over the fence to TRADOC and say, hey, figure it out, right? And, uh, and that, was not the, that was not the case in this instance, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just add one thing is, and, and I wasn't tracking it all that much, but probably Pete, you were. Um, but you know, the joint community was working very, very hard on several information related concepts. Um, and some folks within the Army in that community were participating. Um, and and that, those ideas have resulted in JP304 which should, it was supposed to be published in December, it's not published yet, but like all those big ideas, so there was lots of work done. Um, and from a document perspective, a lot of that was captured then in JP304. Um, it just didn't happen that on the Army side this time. And so you have a draft, which is also draft doctrine, which is also serving as a concept as well, so. Um, so when you're look, talking about this rewrite, um, I was just curious how Ukraine's successes in the information domain, or if they have at all, shaped any of this rewrite and how we examine information operations and advantage. In, in regards to FM30, we have seen nothing that changes the way that we are characterizing the uh, operational environment model. It has validated a lot of what we thought already and, and given us more confidence in the way we've written to the information dimension in the context of the physical um, and the, uh, the human. Um, the Ukraine has done rather well in the information dimension, but they've also, they would not be able to win this fight if they were not able to bring physical destruction down on the Russian forces. The fact that the, you know, Russian 
the Russian forces are, it's not that they don't have a good narrative going, it's the fact they can't put tanks in Kiev or, you know, the, the physical matters. You know, the leadership on the side of the Ukrainians, uh, you know, matters. The, the human will to fight um, matters, which under the joint model, they kind of bend human and information together in the information environment. We purposely pulled it apart into an information dimension and a human dimension just so that you can make, you can better see some of those distinctions. Can you speak to that last uh, perspective a little bit? Because when I think national will, um, which is obviously in the human dimension, but it's obviously significantly influenced by the information dimension. So just kind of your distinguishing and, and why you felt like that was important to distinguish. Well, yeah, and so if we make everything, you know, so pulling this apart and making it, you know, into a, a, a model, uh, if, you, if you can't make distinctions, then you don't have a really good model. Um, I mean, we've discussed that, you know, really, you know, all three of these are interrelated. You can't bin, you, you know, the, the, the way that you look at the dimensions, it's not all that useful to try to bin something, you know, as just being purely a physical thing or just being purely an information thing or as an advantage, you know. So, yes, physical, physical advantages also resonate, you know, re, you know, you could, you know, um, everything is a message, but everything is also physical. I mean, unless it's like imaginary, everything, you know, the, the data in the information, you know, the electrons flying are, are also, they're physical. We sometimes, the model though, it helps to kind of distinguish between those three and then focus on how they interrelate. So this gets back to, you know, your message, your information to be credible has to, you know, be realistic and actually, you know, you, know, you can't say you're winning um, if the tanks are, you know, sitting 30 kilometers outside of Kiev still. You, you, there's, no, there's no story you can, you, you, no information can get you beyond that. You know, the best message you can, you can bring is often in the physical dimension. Um, as well as, in, uh, you know, in human, you know, pull, pull, uh, pulling that apart from the information, you know, human will is, it's emotional. So, you know, that's, that, that is somewhat of the distinction there as well. So you've got to look at the interrelationships, not binning it as purely one thing or one of those three things. Were you ready? Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, Eric talked about the, uh, <coughs> how we redefined the uh, OE and some of the some of the big ideas, and so then when we tackled this information advantage uh, challenge, one of the things that we needed to do was try to make sense of this from an informational perspective, and try to link uh, this idea of multi-domain operations and the importance of these relative advantages uh, as it aligns with a threat as opposed to a threat, and how do we link these different advantages uh, to that idea? Uh, one of the big ideas that came out of the conference was decision dominance. Um, that hasn't been talked to, we haven't talked a lot about that a lot in ADB 313. Uh, you'll see a slide later on why that might be. And then um, um, this idea of the interrelationship between the, the human, physical, and information uh, dimensions. And then we wanted to say, hey, we know we, we figured out in the 48 hours of the, of the conference, the Information Advantage Conference that was held here, but we need a, come some kind of visualization, a good visualization so people can kind of understand, the force can understand what we're getting at. Um, and then uh, we built these lines of effort and realigned some of the, the activities and tasks under these lines of effort so uh, people could better visualize uh, what we're trying to achieve. Anybody have questions on that? Do you have questions? Sir, I noticed you didn't have LOEs on the model anymore. Is that one of the recent changes? No, that's them. Am I crazy? The enable decision making, those are all the lines yeah, of Yeah, so all of those were previously listed as LOEs. Achieve the information advantage activities lines of effort. along five lines of effort. Is what? 
No, it's, I mean, you can see it's, it's a little, I think we've seen it broken out differently, but that's, those are the distinct five lines of effort. So and the, the sentence model, above it shows yeah, the it. Model where you, you just kind of have LEDs and LEDs and those are LEDs. Oh, yeah. well, okay. Yeah. yeah, I think Shaq's exact yeah. critique is LOEs imply a campaign plan versus sure, we'll relevant military capabilities discussion. When I think uh, when they, well, yeah. as they as they go through, I think those will be some of the challenges yeah, that, that they highlight in their Relevant pref. military care, we, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but relevant military capability, that was to show we're going to use all relevant capabilities to, to you know, along these five LOEs, to conduct these activities along these five LOEs. And, but, but I think that relevant military capability idea is going away. So, yeah, we still have LOEs. We still don't know how many they're going to be or what the <laughs> tiles are going to be. You know, hopefully we're finding out in another, another couple of weeks. Anything else on this? I hate this slide. Next one. <laughs> <laughs> well, because all anybody looks at is this, right? And, and like the biggest whizzing contest we're in right now is like, uh, uh, you, you know, and again, this is with like Demo G3 or Demo SO. Is it uh, enable decision making or enable commander decision making? I mean, just little things like that where people just, they look at top level stuff on the logic chart and they don't bother to read the content underneath and then they want to fight you to the death over, you know, over that word uh, on, on the summary slide. You know, it's like, it's like fighting the executive summary. Okay, so what's different about this book? And this is all my opinion and this is based off, you know, again, some stuff we've done before. Uh, you know, we have no I.O. and no information related capabilities uh, in this manual. Uh, and you know that's not different. JP304 is getting rid of I.O. Uh, and it's also not talking in terms of information related capabilities. Uh, and I believe Marine Corps Doctrine Publication 8, their book, their draft on information, does not talk about those either. So we're kind of in line with the joint guys. Uh, but for the third time in 20 years, we're getting rid of I.O. Uh, and we'll see how that works out. I kind of mentioned that this applies across, home uh, across the continuum earlier on. There is a lot of stuff you got to worry about at home station uh, that, you, that, like, I didn't think about when I was a commander, you know, the, back a long time ago. Uh, you know, I wasn't worried about anybody screwing up the, uh, uh, you know, the, the transportation network to get from, you know, Fort Hood to Houston or Beaumont or where we used to ship out of or to Fort Irwin or wherever. You, you know, it was just, you were just going to do it. Uh, and now, you know, like one of the most vulnerable networks out there are transportation networks, right? Uh, you have to worry about what Joe sees. Everybody's got a device that they're on, you know, all day long. And, and you know, when we talked about it earlier, Pat, it's like, you know, pe the people believe, like, the first thing they read. And, like, commanders got to be on the lookout for stuff uh, to be able to counter that or correct it. Uh, it's not just a public affairs thing. And then the OPSEC aspect of it as well, uh, you know, trying to hide indicators. Uh, even as early as, uh, you know, pre-deployment in the home station. Uh, we talked the new OE model, we talked the dimensions, we talked kind of the uh, lines of effort. Uh, you know, that, that, that placing information in the operations realm rather than the specialist realm, that's not really new. We try to do that in, I think, 2001 and again in 2008, uh, and then again in 2011, but like never took hold, okay? And I think that's because like, We've made it like this. We've made it mystical and this special thing when really we need to demystify it and make it kind of part of day-to-day -day operations. Uh, uh, so that's kind of why I put that one up there. Uh, I think we emphasize OPSEC and deception in this a little more than we have in the past. Uh, you know, when I think OPSEC, I'm thinking like field craft type of stuff that we've forgotten how to do. You know, camouflage. You, you know, combat park your Humvee and put cardboard over the glass thinking about your electronic signature and emissions control, thinking about the forms of contact, uh, you know, thinking about noise and light discipline, all these things that, that we kind of stopped doing the last 20 years. Uh, and then we're trying to big back the idea of deception writ large. So the F-830s and the military deception of people have come up with this theology, uh, you know, during the last 20 years that, that basically it says if you want to do any type of deception, you got to get approval two levels up. And, Kind of our consensus is, is if I'm a company commander and I'm about to assault the objective and I want to send somebody over to flank and start tossing smoke grenades or flashbangs, uh, you know, I don't need to get permission from my uh, brigade commander to do that, okay? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life, but 
If you go down to that proponent down there, they will tell you that's what you need to do. Uh, so no, not, not gonna do that. We're trying to make the section should be part of every plan that you write. It just should be part of what you do uh, kind of for a living. Uh, and then this one, I don't know if it's gonna survive. I mentioned earlier, we put a chapter seven out there that a lot of you've seen. Uh, we had lines of effort and the activities in there. We tried to assign staff leads. I think that was a flaw in the 2008 version. We didn't assign staff leads for task. I don't know if chapter seven is gonna survive. You know, I don't know how that's kind of gonna look in the end or if we're even gonna get that, that level of detail in there, okay? Because uh, Mike's gonna talk about some of the staffing results and some of the changes we're probably gonna make and the big issues we have. Questions on this? What are you excited for? Like the, with the changes in the in current draft? Excited for it to be over. <laughs> Is that good enough? Uh, I, 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 to me, it is, uh, it, to me, it's the just making it part of trying to emphasize what you can do over what you can do. You know, and I've told that story where, you know, God bless you guys, but you're going to quote chapter and verse what, what I can't do when you're going to get all jazzed up if I talk about influence when I'm talking about it more. But the public office stood up in front of God and country last year and said, you don't need anybody's permission to tell the truth. You know, if something's going on, like at Fort Hood, Texas, you know, you don't need somebody's permission to tell the truth. You can get up in front and tell the truth. Uh, you got to, we're talking about being proactive in this stuff. You know, why did, uh, there was a Major General Eflon got suspended from being first cavalry division commander, right? And they had an investigation, and I think he was cleared, and what was his next duty assignment? I think it was going to be the deputy uh, R South commander, right? So, so all of a sudden he goes from being like, as far as Amini is concerned, he's like this disgraced general officer, and the next thing you know, it's like, oh, he's, what do you mean he's being assigned to be a, a commander, a deputy commander? Why were, we, why was public affairs not in front of that, right? Why did public affairs not say, hey, this could cause a problem, and we probably ought to, you know, get something out there that says, hey, we finished this investigation, and this guy's been cleared and he's gonna move on to his army career, okay? No, we threw that out there, and then we're surprised when people got jacked up. But then you look at like what General Beagle did down at Fort Jackson, right? What happened down at Fort Jackson? The, the, the bus incident. Yeah, the some, incident some recruit with, a, with an M16 took a bus full of school kids, right? Hijacked it for a while. And what did General Beagle do? He got it, right? Yeah, he got out there and said, look, there was no rounds, no weapon, we got under control, and, and like it won't happen again. Changed a bunch of yeah, things. she took the narrative away from it. Yeah, right. So it's like a big deal, and people, and it's not just like general officers need to think that way. The staff needs to be kind of looking at stuff so like that. Kind of, so. Chuck. I'm glad you're using these examples because this is exactly the point about where does, in the case of public affairs, and when we're looking at outward facing information going out, and you know, and you you just said it. You know, two levels up, I'm getting the approval for X, Y, and Z. It's because you you know we're always trained in a way to make sure that we're not getting ahead of the bosses, quote unquote. Um, and I think that example like that, examples like that, actually bring something to bear when we deal with operational issues. Fort Hood, you know, for all of the, 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 the things that kind of rolled that out there, uh, had significant high impact consequences that no matter what, breaking bad news is still gonna hurt. It is going to hurt, yeah. and it's going to be one of those things that you're just not going to be able to avoid. I think one of the questions is, is that second and third order effect that we're trying to deal with. You know, you use the word human as a dimension. I would argue that there's a, the, 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 the cognitive portion, I know nobody likes to use that word, but when you get right down to it, what we're really dealing with is, is how people perceive what's going, how they think, how they're framing what is being presented to them, you know, and it's and it's it is uh, and it's it's the psyop community and the proponent IO proponent kind of capture a bit of this, and we don't do psychology well in the army. We suck at that. But the thing about when we're dealing with the human dimension, when we're dealing with people and the audiences, that's probably been the best descriptor I've heard from the Marines and actually from from other folks in terms of. How does this read, whether it's in the New York Times to the folks that are gonna be on the Hill, 
versus the people in Colleen versus you know, the army writ large and where that kind of all falls out. And that's not only in relation to our own internal operations. This is also in relation to operations external to mm -hmm. us. I think this is where we're not having that we're not touching that conversation. We're not really nailing it. I mean, a few years back, we tried with 7-4 fighting function. A lot of different things got tossed out. But, you know, as I was telling one of uh, the scholars, is just because it was an old idea that got discredited years ago doesn't mean that that old idea doesn't have nuggets in there that could be helpful, especially when dealing with, you know, trying to anchor competing different very challenging situations that are being faced. The, the other piece deals with deception. I hate to say it, but just watching AOC this last time around and watching how staff groups are struggling with deception, it starts with what does the enemy expect? You know, how do you actually do, and then what can we weight that with? That is heavily inside the realm of having an understanding of the cognitive dimension of how somebody thinks. And again, we're, we really talk around it. I, I think that's why it's, it's easy to throw rocks at the doctrine. It's easy to throw rocks at that stuff in there. But when we really get down inside of this, if war is this you know, contest of wills, I better have an understanding of the will that I'm competing against or that I'm fighting against. And it seems as if at least the Marines have kind of kept it at a, a smaller box you know, in terms of the, the dash eight that they're working on. But I think that they're framing, and I think that, the, that, that we need to get inside this a little bit better because the Brits, and I think I've shot you guys, the Brits and the Aussies, I don't know what it is with our Five Eyes partners, but they tend to, they tend to be more in that arena. I don't know why, but they tend to, to write that way, and they tend to emphasize that. Um, I just don't know, you know, probably doesn't have resonance, too many, too many rice bowls, too many uh, fixed thinking, but we keep doing the same thing over and over we're not gonna get anything any different. And, and I think that's one of the reasons, that, like nobody here is an information guy, right? Uh, and that's why, I think that's why they gave it to us is because, you know, the trying to look at it from a combined arms, you know, kind of point of view and how could this be useful uh, uh, from a combined arms perspective. What, what do we need to say, you know, in order for this to be, to be useful to a staff and a community? And, and the only other thing I'm excited about is what we talked about, the .mil PF stuff. I'm excited about that. If the .mil PF stuff actually happens, I am excited about that. Can, can I just ask on your last point, uh, of course, none of you guys do an IO individual, uh, and that you think that was kind of almost intentional to make it so that it relates to the command. Do you think that's been successful? Do you think you, it's better to not have it, or do you think you should have had it? I think we were, I think we fell into the same trap when we wrote this draft that we have, you know, we, we, we said, here's these, lines of inf here's these lines of effort, and enable decision making is C2, and Intel, and protect belongs to the cyber, COE, and inform, belongs to the public affairs guy, and influence belongs to the SoCo guy, and, and IW is obviously cyber, right, because that was their, our cyber, so that's their idea, our cyber security. So, so we, we, we fell in that same trap, we kind of came up with a different word for information related capabilities. And then we let those guys go and do, you know, what they do. And and it shows, okay? So that's kind of why we're trying to not do that anymore. You know, with the various trying to take ownership. Uh, just because somebody is a proponent for a line of effort doesn't mean they ought to be writing that chapter and describing how it's gonna be employed, right? Yeah, but you know, it was chop chop, they want it right now and and uh, uh, you know, team of folks, and we had X number of months to get a draft out. So hopefully, again, the changes we make will we'll bring it more back to center and more along the Marine line of you know kind of book. And again, Mike's going to talk about that, I think, here uh, in a bit. Am I up? I think you're up. I'm up. So we sent this out in November. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so what you got here is our the comments that came. It was it was a good staffing. We got uh, service components. We had the Marine Corps uh, coming us. We had several corps, multiple divisions, all the COE. So it got a lot of traffic and we got a lot of comments. So you see, you know, 1,940. I've been doing this for a while. That's up there on the number. Uh, so it was pretty large. And so what do you do 
when you have all this data, right, you have 550 pages worth of comments. You got to organize them somehow, right? And so we were able to kind of, you know, a lot of it was misspelling, and that's me because I can't spell threat. I spell it treat, and that's me. Um, and so we got 100 comments on that, but, um, and a couple other ones like that. But, but we had to organize these. And so, you know, look at these right now on the board. This is probably going to uh, spur some thinking because um, we got a little bit more to go. We're going to talk in some detail on like the first three or four, but some of these might spur some thinking. Um, down there at the bottom, taxonomy. It just says multiple taxonomies. So we got to deal with them. We've, I've heard some of this today, right? So let's look at that, the taxonomies of peoples from a PSYOP perspective and a PA perspective and the words we got. Internal, external audiences, key publics. We've got target audiences. Uh, so that was kind of a thing we got to work through. Also, just the word information itself and the types of information. And then this taxonomy of bad information, propaganda, uh, disinformation, misinformation, information for effect. We've got a lot of comments like, so what are we going to do? So there's some work to be done. Now, the good news is we think we have a good recommendation for all of these. We just got to get to the decision maker or decision makers to get them. And we have started writing uh, again. And so what I'm excited about is rewriting this thing because I think, it's just, it's my opinion, but as Chuck said, we had a short timeline. We organized a team. The team was a lot of specialists. We kind of wrote the chapter one and the, and the various COEs wrote the other things and it had that flavor. Well, right now it's me and Jesse rewriting this book, artillery guy and infantry guy. And I think that might, I don't know. I think it's going to give it a different flavor. And we'll talk about this when we want to get back to fundamentals, but we've been studying Marine Corps 8 pretty hard. Um, I think it reads well, um, and it is fundamental in nature. So um, I'm excited about rewriting this. And I think um, if we sell it well, maybe like, because you go to talk to battalion commanders, brigade commanders, not all of those, but a lot of times they give the stiff arm about information. If we write this right, everyone might be concerned about gaining information advantages in various ways and how can we do it. And we don't necessarily need to have, you know, this specialty or that specialty. I have stuff right there in my brigade that I can do a lot of stuff with. So that's what I'm excited about. So we'll come back to some of these, but the next thing we're going to get into was that bullet number one, which was level of detail. Um, lots of comment. Too much detail or add detail? I mean, we got like three pages of, of adding data analytics, right? And, and so lots. So we had to come, come back to and think about. Uh, who said who was it? She works for Jeff. Oh, okay. So we got a lot of comments on adding data analytics. So we had to come back and uh, kind of think through what is doctrine, right? And what are the categories of doctrine? So you see that up in the slide, right? But you, everyone by now knows we kind of have three categories. We have ADPs, fundamental principles, the big idea, the frame, right? And if you read our draft, you could probably say we're, we're maybe a little bit more FM in some places, maybe ADP level. So we had to kind of think through that a little bit. And so that has led us to kind of the, the first thing on, on making decisions on how we're going to deal with a lot of these issues is this point right here. So um, our recommendation is that we're going to keep this ADP at the fundamental level. So that's going to change a bunch of things. And a lot of detail is going to come out of there. And it's going to be written probably uh, in more broad terms. Now, some people might not like that. Um, but that's kind of the direction we're going. And that actually helps us answer some of the multiple comments in here uh, uh, how to deal with. So, so that we're planning on uh, our focus being fundamentals. Uh, next slide. Did you want to talk this one? Yeah, just, just, just let me say one thing okay. about that. Is, is we really struggled with this whole idea, you know, level of detail. Uh, because in the back, because at the same time that we're doing ADP 313, about half of us are thinking about FM 313. Uh, you know, what I'm thinking about is how am I going to get somebody else to do it? Uh, 
so I don't have to be involved. But really, you know, there's going to be a lag time of probably two years from the time we publish this ADP until an FM goes out, right? It's just the way it is. Uh, and so we were trying to make it to where, you know, there was enough detail to where someone could pick this up and, like, not only understand these new ideas but might be able to implement them. Uh, but then at some point in time, we realized that, like, the how I don't think is really – like, FM 313 is not an awful book, right? I mean, it still has a lot – it's still going to have a lot of relevant information in it. And so maybe we didn't need to be in such a hurry to uh, go into huge detail like that. So, yeah. All right. So, um, I think someone was, someone was going to ask a question later on about kind of this cultural change and how it matters to other people. Um, and I, we think that this is what Mike alluded to is how we get there. Um, and the three bullets on the bottom are probably the salient points on this one. Is if it's not useful, if 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 it's not useful to everybody no one cares, or only some people care. So it's, it needs to be useful to the company commander. It needs to be useful to the battalion commander, the brigade commander, um, and they need to be able to understand it. And they have to, it has to be useful no matter what they're doing, whether they're, we're, we're in conflict, if we're doing theater security cooperation. Uh, it has to be a good framework so they can visualize uh, what we're talking about or what they're talking about or what they're talking to each other about. So when a battalion commander converses with the battalion staff, there can be a, a coherent conversation. And when the battalion commander talks about a certain aspect of information, the battalion staff officer should understand what they mean. Um, right now, we spend half our time, I think, talking past each other. So when I have the, the psyopper talking to me, I don't know what the heck they're talking about as a field artillery officer. Because there's so many terms that Chuck alluded to earlier in the brief. So part of this is a common lexicon, a common framework that we can visualize what we mean when we say information and how advantages relate to the employment or use of different types of techniques or approaches uh, to gaining advantages. Um, any questions? Yep. because we're not expecting all soldiers to conduct field artillery tasks. What we're expecting with information is everybody plays a role, right? And so everybody needs to understand what we mean when we use specific terms as it relates to information because it's valuable to everybody. And every soldier on the battlefield can achieve various advantages when it comes to information. Um, and it doesn't have to be strategic level. It's can be very tactical and when people think about information and how they relate to information and how their activities and actions generate information or signatures and various things like that, it matters. So we need the force to buy in. They need to think about what they're doing, how they're doing it, what the impact is before they take action or do it. doesn't mean that, that they're, they're constrained from that. This is a demystification of this idea. Now, now various, various specialties are going to have very specific terminology that they converse with. I don't care. Talk about all the, the cyber stuff you want to, but don't talk to me about it. I want to talk to you about information in a common lexicon. Um, and depending upon what level of commander or staff is involved, there will be various levels of understanding of various lexicons. Um, and other people will have other specialties uh, depending upon what their experience uh, has been. Any other, anything else? Question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> clearly not smart enough. Yep, there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, so, sorry, I'm coming into this uh, a little bit late. I had an earlier meeting. Um, so, my name is Monique Guerrero, and I am uh, the lifelong PSYOP officer. Um, and I um, also just to give you a little bonus videos, I kind of wanted to 
uh, pipe in on this when um, Dr. M was talking, but um, I actually wrote the original draft of the mil Army's military deception program. Um, because prior to Annie Pruitt and I writing it along with Amy Burroughs, there was not an Army military deception booklet of any kind. Uh, it was all joint doctrine, which makes sense because you look at your levels of approval and where you have to go. So we, we went in and we wrote, um, wrote that. Um, and so anybody that um, has gone through and actually read that FM and gone through and understands um, the line, and, and I work, you know, um, on the MMAS with Andrew, and we started talking about things that you can do left of the red line and what you can do after home station stuff, blah, 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 blah. So I won't get into all that. Uh, but to your point, though, um, Colonel Bell, as a PSYOP officer, having worked at some extremely high levels, um, I want to push back a little bit uh, on all, with all of this. It's less about talking about lexicons, and it's less about talking in a common language. It's more about you have to come to me and talk to me about effects. A and that's where the problem comes in. Um, and a very simple tactical point is uh, being there in Fallujah one, two, three, and six, and several other ones. Um, the problem was that the, and I was there with the Marines, all the Marines, um, they would come and they would say, hey, we need, we need this X destroyed, which to you, um, as an artilleryman or an infantryman, is going to mean something completely different than to me as a PSYOP officer. So what I would push back on and say, you know, you need to tell me what effect you want. What effect do you want? Because do you really want that destroyed? Because I'm using that radio station. Um, and I'm using that radio station for a bunch of different things. What you really mean is, hey, I need this radio station not to be able to broadcast or I need this radio station to broadcast over wrote, overwritten, over spoken, whatever, from these hours because we know for a fact that they're using this radio station to broadcast our convoy we need. So it's less about a, a common language and it's about people understanding what the hell they actually need and want. Once you figure that out, then you can come to your three, your five, your whoever, and they can point you in the direction of who needs to know that, who needs to be in the mood to make that decision, and how you're going to across getting that. So, I mean, we can speak lexicon, we can speak languages, we can speak acronyms all day, and how we know we're not going to speak the same language. We're simply not going to. It's, it's just not going to happen. But if people can really start the critical thinking, which is what they're supposed to be learning here, and be able to identify what effect they want, then the information advantage comes with that. Um, so again, I'm sorry for coming in late. I am obviously extremely passionate about this. I spent my entire life working on this. Um, and this is a thing that as an instructor, as a commander, as a leader, I continue to talk to. I do it with my kid. I do it with my husband. I'm probably going to get divorced and then living in, you know, <laughs> single somewhere because they're going to leave me. But they have to come with me and tell me what effect are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And if I know that, then I know how to help you. And I think that's where a lot of times that cross problem comes is the, they're not speaking in what is my end state here and then how can I help you do that um, it becomes very important. A lot of this then becomes more of a paradigm shift in my personal opinion because commanders have to have buy-in on the military deception plan. They have to have buy-in on the PSYOP program. They have to have buy-in on the information advantage because we're playing a long game. We're not playing short play, we're playing a long game. And so our long game isn't, I I'm not gonna get this done in seven months. But if you stay on path, you stay on course, and we tweak this, and we have branches and sequels, I can get this done in 17 months but you've got to have that buy-in. And then it's the commander willing to assume the risk, willing to assume giving up those resources, willing to um, divide and conquer and put that stuff towards it. Um, I have not read this manual yet. Um, I was not on the copy, the, you know, the courtesy copy or whatever to get it. I would love to get my hands on it um, and take a look through it and I will not send you feedback about your inability to spell. Um, but provide some background and criticism on this because this is where a lot of times the people that work in the information world 
and we work in the information related capabilities, which I'm sure that you guys have changed that term. That's where I personally see a lot of these problems coming in is, is that speaking in effect, getting the buy-in, assuming the risk, allocating the resources, and making sure the right people in the room know what's going on. Um, again, I'm not angry with anybody, this is just how I speak. Um, <laughs> try to tone it down, but I see some people looking at me saying, hey, yeah, you know. Ma'am, where have you been all my life? So I think those, those were some good comments. I'm gonna keep them moving forward so they can get through the rest of it, and I'm sure that'll generate some of the conversation that'll come back up at the, at the end. Um, but I think we, we need to continue pressing a little bit unless you wanna respond to Colonel. Yeah, there's a whole lot there. Yeah. Um, I don't know, there's about 15 different salient points that I'd have to unpack of what you said. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, I agree with you and don't necessarily agree with you at the same time. Um, I think as a specialist, let's say field artillery is my specialty, I don't necessarily expect people to speak to me in precise field artillery terms. Um, I don't necessarily expect for them to understand lead times on some, some things. It's my job as a specialist to lead them to the right answer. Um, and determine uh, through a discourse, a staff process uh, with the commander or whoever I'm supporting, uh, what they want and what they need as a specialty. Um, so there's different aspects to these advantages that we can create with information. Um, as a military deception planner at a geographic and combatant command level and participating in some of those things, uh, yes, you are correct. There's some very specific authorities and resources and other things. Um, but there's lots of uh, trickery uh, that tactical forces can do uh, that don't require those authorities or resources that are within the realm of the tactical commander. And part of the problem, I think, with the Army, uh, not a problem, but a challenge that we face um, from an informational perspective is lead times of six months don't help a company commander or a brigade commander when they're in a fight. And so when we talk about some of these, these very high level strategic types of things, that doesn't resonate with the brigade commander or the battalion commander or company commander. It's not particularly helpful for them. And so when we talk about these things and this common language and how we can use the force, not specific echelons can use, but the force writ large can use some of these, these ideas that we can push forward and maybe ingrain in our culture a little bit. Those are the types of ideas that are most important because that's 99% of the army, not the rest of the small specialty army that, that enjoys these exquisite capabilities or has access to it. I know how my, I, I use my cell phone all the time. I don't care how it works. When I get on it, I can talk, right? So that's what matters. A soldier wants a cell phone they can pick up and a tool that they can use, right? And so we wanna make this idea accessible to them, right? So this, 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 this kind of tactical level language um, that we hope to impart, um, this, this, fundament this fundamental ideas um, that we hope will be helpful and it doesn't, it doesn't take away from some of the, the specialty type of things. Um, or this, uh, it doesn't take away from um, you know, cyberspace um, or any of the very um, technical aspects of this. Um, but we need to be able to talk about these things and everybody, a common understanding of what we're talking about. And then when it comes to specialties, they have their own language um, that they speak in and they should help the rest of us who are dumb and in ignorant to these, these very specific types of things. Um, for example, effects types of, different types of effects um, that the specialists can help coach them through that as part of the normal staff process, which I think we do um, oh, fairly well. Um, but we'll move on. I'm not gonna let you pass. Okay, go ahead. So let me, let me kind of sure. roll a little bit in. Um, you're hitting on a lot of great things. I think one of the issues is, is what if I, you know, the, I'm totally in a 
file an agreement with you in this discussion about operations and it's got to be operationally relevant and it's got and it's got to be translatable but I will argue that when this thing doesn't work what's the first thing we do yell for Sigo. yeah of course we yell for Sigo, right and but the real issue is, is this is majority of everybody they don't know how this works it's a radio right and we don't even do that well and my point to a lot of this, it goes back to commanders and staffs. I just need to science you. I need to nerd you up just a little bit because the truth is if I don't, if we don't get a common understanding of principles by which this stuff works, and granted, FM 312 does not help you when I discuss Doden, but when I tell you that that information network, it's trons flowing over the air. It's the Ukrainian battalion that got wiped out with that MRL because of this, right? Of things that are inside this environment that there are more sensors now on the battlefield because this exists. And that by the way, the majority of the platforms that are allowing bad guys to target us right now are on Facebook and on Twitter and GitHub. That's the environment. That's really the environment. And in very, very concrete terms, that whether folks are doing it in the motor pool or not. So that's one level. What Mo is bringing up is something that I think we all deep down in our hearts know when we get right down to it is is like, no, I need those people who are all the, you know, that are all in the specialty, exquisite, whatever. There's nothing special or exquisite. It's just war fighting. It's just another set of tools. I don't sit in the back bench as an ISR guy, because you need me. You can't hit anything if I don't find it for you, right? But then I can't find stuff for you and tell you where it is if I don't have a network. And by the way, if we don't have a stack of something that's holding that data, that exquisite data, that an AFA TADS, or for that matter, that brute force tracker that you're going to go ahead and maneuver off of because you want to be the next 73 Easting guy or gal, sorry. And, and this is where I think this thing about, and this is just Army stuff. Everything that we've had on MDO points totally different. God bless the Marines. At least they're trying a couple of things out there. They might get their, they're, they're having a fight, but they're at least having an honest fight about it in terms of not only simplifi simplification of the doctrine and the concept, but literally the concept. You know, and, and I think that's where <clears throat> I agree, it has to be useful for all echelons, but you can't write it in such a watered down term that nobody cares. I liked Sally's MMAS, but the truth, hard truth, tell me something I don't already know about the history of IO. And we're gonna take away terms that, how, then what am I gonna use if I'm not gonna use information related capabilities? And so and then I have to go to nerd, oh, hell no. But, I ha but we've gotta have, and this is maybe a small critique, but in writing it, there's a two-sided piece to this. Am I on your team or not? And I'm not saying that in a negative way, but what I'm saying is, is that when we start looking at these formations, the kind of things that are gonna be happening, they imply that you're gonna have to have a different kind of game, set of tactics, set of practitioners. Uh, Leo Garcia had brought up, and thanks Shaq for bringing this up, and he talked about dissecting the problem, and I don't, I, I probably won't quote him exactly the same, but you know, he, he's the guy that's working the big data thing and how to make it a you know, weapon system, but I just keep coming back to this idea that you know, we talk around the stuff, but when we're really not looking at from each of these lenses and each of these things, we're like, how are we really getting after, are we getting the, the right language and in terms of the effects, which is what, Mo, you were bringing up. What is it that you want? And one thing, I, we don't have the luxury of a whole bunch of people. But you know, one of the things with doctrine in terms of it's setting the expectations, it's gotta be more than just a check the block, and I'm not speaking to, to you all, really to all the COEs and to the teams that are gonna be looking at it. And how serious are we going to be about this? You know, and I, and I think that's where as the, I fight information. I'm sorry, I just do, that's what I do. I just happen to do Intel, a little bit of cyber on the side. But that's how, that's how you gotta look at it. 
And it's not just simply from a standpoint. There's offense, defense, all the other pieces there, but it's also in terms of who's in the position to know. Who's in the position to make, help make the decision or make the decision? And that's kind of the place where I think I don't need a big OPT or targeting boards. Everything is not, it's not situated that way. Not in this environment, not at the speed that we're talking about. We do it with JTACs all the time, where I've already pressed the authorities down. You know, and some basic principles in which these things operate. Some of it is a case of we just are, not, are just not paying attention to it. Some of it is we're not talking to our commanders clearly enough about it. Others of it is as a staffs, we're failing in terms of just ourselves talking with one another. You know, to be able to go ahead and present options. Um, so, I'm sorry, it just like I said, I think that's one of the things about, I think, yes, you need a taxonomy. Yes, we need to go ahead and have that agreed upon. But you need the diversity of the points of view that are going to be going inside of it to talk about how do I fight these things? You know, how do these things, how are they actually integrated? And those are going to be actually the things that become important, not only to non-practitioners, but to, you know, for practitioners, they need to, we need to have a hook into that to truly get after whether it's combined arms, multi-domain. You have to have those examples or else it doesn't mean anything. So I don't know if there's something we said that somehow implies that we don't think anything that you just said is important. Um, Go to that one slide, though, that had an ADP, an FM. How many intelligence, every int, there's an FM for? Think of all the various capabilities available in this field. There's an FM or multiple ATPs on. So there, it's rich doctrine out there. What we want to do here with this ADP, if we get our way, on the fundamentals is what's the framework which we all can operate in? What can we understand? What are the lines of effort? What do they generally consist of? And then, I mean, think about a naval decision making. It's the network, it's command and control, and intelligence. We have lots and lots of doctrine. He writes six, I write five, and there's a gazillion books for that. And then we have a whole signal center, right? on the whole network piece. So that's out there, but what's the framework? How does that fit into a bigger idea of yeah. advantages, decision dominance, et cetera? So I think that's kind of what we, we think this book needs to do for us. Because if it provides a common framework for the Army, that we're all in the same language on that framework, and I think it would be better um, for all the other things that we, we gotta do that, that everyone's been mentioning. Yes, sir. I think we're all in violent agreement, and so I definitely don't want to turn this into contentious, you know, uh, conversation um, because I am really glad that I'm not the one up there trying to break this stuff down. Um, I completely understand. There are, you know, having worked down at SOCOM and these high levels and be able to work out these plans for a long time, that's great. But having the our newest commanders, these guys coming up through the ranks, having the ability, that flexibility to do what we used to call tactical deception, where they could sort of make it up on the fly, and that's why you have it, they only have to go two levels up and say, hey, look, this is what's going on. And so this, this battlefield and what they're facing now, it is moving much, much faster than you know, what I saw when I was going through it. And so this, this thing that we preach about mission command and trust, that's a bunch of crap. And these commanders and guys and guys on the ground, they have got to have the faith of their commanders and the trust. And I'm hoping that you're putting that in there that it talks to them about they've got to be able to make that decision on the fly. Of like, you wanted me to go left, but I see what's left. Look, if I don't go right, we're walking into something. And be able to make that decision on the fly through that tactical deception, through that mission command, through that trust and framework, because they're the ones on the ground seeing it. And I watched this through, you know, my little girl playing basketball, going from rec league to now we're spending thousands of dollars a month traveling out all across the country. And what makes her a better baller is that she's looking up when she's dribbling. And she can see the court. She can see what's around her. And so I can see it from the stands, but she's got to be able to see it on the ground. And the issue is, is that, yeah, this is great and our radios are great, but if that guy or gal on the ground can't communicate back because they're dribbling with their head down, 
then that's where we start having these problems and it's giving them that trust. And so all of this becomes very important and then sticking in there like what Pete was talking about with the OPSEC piece of it um, and having that piece in there. All of this, tr you're trying to cram a lot in here um, and great Americans, God bless you for trying to do it. Uh, so, so I'm gonna stop really quick because I know we're starting to diverge, so I apologize for cutting you off, but we're starting to kind of go off on a different path than I think what their intent was with talking about how they are bringing it up a level from where it's been a focus where we have a lot of that detail, trying to distill it into a more general term for the entire army. So I'm gonna let them continue because they're gonna talk about um, some of the ways that they're, they're comparing to some of the other constructs. And while this is a rich vein, um, we're running out of time, so we need to, to get them on. So, go ahead. We don't have to get through all the slides. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not necessary. <laughs> some of these discussions are pretty good. Uh, so another thing, uh, some of the comics were not enough discussion or linkage to joint, uh, emerging joint doctrine, existing uh, joint doctrine. Um, I think we kind of scratched the itch a little bit in the draft. Um, generally speaking, we're pretty well aligned, and I think largely because I think Far Cyber had some people on the on the JP uh, 304 team or were, were involved with it, and so some things carried through to the through the concept that they had or the idea that they had that they pitched here at the uh, at the uh, conference. And if you looked up look at some of the tasks up there, we're we're almost uh, directly aligned. Um, but it's kind of not it's kind of not the same thing and and why why do I say that um, the way that the joint function in JP 304 approaches this is as a joint function and we have not done that um, due to the senior leader guidance is we're not going to create an information war fighting function um, and so that has implications those implications aren't so obvious until you kind of start trying to peel back the onion and figure out how you're actually going to execute this idea, all right, this, this approach, and who's responsible for it. And it kind of goes back to what Mr. Schrenkel said earlier, who's responsible. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the, one of the things w that we're working through is kind of what are the implications of not making information a warfighting function and still making this idea make sense, this approach make sense, make people understand how it works. Um, so that's one, that's the thing. Any, any thoughts on this? This is a big deal here, right? You, you already mentioned, Pete, about um, the seventh war fighting function in this. So it, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, but I, yeah, th this is senior yeah. leader directed, no, no. no function. And so it, it, it does make it a little bit of challenging on how you're gonna write about it. And so what that means is, is I think, you know, we explain war fighting functions by a series of tasks and systems that have all the capabilities. So. In the Army, we can bend everything into one of these war fighting functions which generate combat power, right? And so we're using all these portions of these things to do stuff. So if information advantage is not a war fighting function, then all this stuff has to reside in one of the war fighting functions. So that makes it a little bit challenging because some stuff's over here in command and control, some stuff's over here in fires, some stuff's in maneuver. Right, so that makes it a little bit of a challenge, you know, in writing. But I, I think we might be okay, um, you know, getting through that. But that was that was a big issue. I have some similar sure. uh, comment in regards to that. I just think that, you know, given the fact that it's not a war fighting function, um, and you know, all of the different wheelhouses that have the capabilities that are required to operationalize information. It's just, I've kind of lost my word a little bit, but without it being a war fighting function, without having a entity to fight it, we don't have the organization as it stands right now 
to operationalize it effectively, right? You're still, in a way, we're still sending silos to address an, an operating environment, right? Because we're not, we're not just saying that the information environment is a thing of its own. Now we're saying the operating environment is inclusive of the information dimension, but we don't want to organize in a way that addresses it effectively, yeah, you know? So let, me, let me just add one thing to that. So if you look at the uh, lines of effort, they're pretty divergent. Think of the difference between, well, I mean, there's similarities, but think about enable decision making. We're doing everything we can to understand, right? Communicate information, to make decisions and to act. That's what that line of effort's all about. Um, so who's in charge of that? Yeah, right? So it's gonna be, you're kind of like, we know the Intel guys are helping us, we know the KM dudes are helping us, we know um, um, the network, it's a whole bunch, so it is all, so I think if, if you, how would you account for that in a war fighting function since that's already accounted for in command and control and intelligence? So that's one. So then you look at, well maybe parts of this, maybe the last three LOEs, maybe bend together and that's an entity that forms maybe, when we get down the road a little bit, you know, a information staff section in the G3 or something like that. But if you look at, uh, the point that I'm making is, is this accounts for, this idea accounts for like a whole bunch of stuff, which I would, I mean, I don't know how we would make it uh, like a war fighting function if you accounted for C2 and Intel that's already there, because that's pretty much accounted for too, so. I don't know if that makes any sense. Okay. Uh, somebody already brought up this uh, idea of the IRCs. Um, lots of discussion, lots of lots of feedback on IRCs um, or our idea of core information capabilities. Um, and generally, they kind of fell into two bins on the core information capabilities. One, my capability isn't there and I'm a core information capability, I need to be on the list. Um, and two was, what's the difference? Why are we making core information capabilities? Why don't we just say information related capabilities? Aren't you just, it's just a synonym, what's the point? Why just leave, just leave it the way it was? Um, don't create this new idea. And then kind of our synthesis of this is kind of the third bullet is a lot of these core information capabilities are very, or tend to be echelon specific. Um, and very, yeah, very unit specific, specific types of units. And it kind of leads you down a, in a rat hole you don't necessarily want to get into an ADP level discussion. Um, because if you want this, this ADP level doctrine to be inclusive rather than exclusive, then everybody needs to have stake in this idea. Um, and so kind of our feeling uh, is that we're probably going to pull away from this idea of core information capabilities as we write <coughs> this publication. There certainly are um, units that are specifically designed to 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 form to have specific capabilities. That's why we have force design and, and design units in specific ways. Um, there are some units that are, that are designed with information in mind or various aspects of information types of things. But the vast majority of units that are going to be employing this doctrine and using this doctrine as a framework to conduct operations aren't one of those people. They're outside this group. Um, and so, um, we think that for this book, for this, this idea that we're gonna t try to um, inculcate through the force is that we kind of don't focus on these ideas of specific core capabilities um, and be more inclusive of information as an idea, how we use it, um, how we gain advantages from it, um, and so on and so forth.
I think a big part of it was, you know, the joint folks who got rid of IRCs. The IRC list had grown exponentially over the years, right? So you go back and look, I think we had like four or five core capabilities at one point in time, and then we came up with the idea of supporting capabilities, and then we had core supporting related capabilities, uh, and, and they were all kind of what we would consider information, but then we started throwing things like maneuver and physical destruction, and, and, and next thing you know, like what was the difference between information operations and operations writ large, right? So if everything was uh, could be used for I.O., then I.O. was nothing, right? I.O. was operations. So we've taken a different kind of approach this time. You, you know, we're not focusing on, you know, mill deck. And I, I mean, we're talking about it, right? But like protection is not just electronic protect and I don't know what they call it now, cyber computer network defense is what I used to know it as, right? Like we're talking about security activities too, right? Like counter reconnaissance and things like that. Like there's maneuver actions that you can do that are inf that, that, that are kind of fall underneath the information advantage umbrella uh, but we would not bend them as an information-related capability. You know, the old model we would. But it's like, look, just use what you need, okay? There's capabilities out there, uh, you know, things, that, and here's some things that you can use to achieve or, you know, to kind of conduct these activities along these lines of effort. Uh, and again, the, the big killer was I am not having one more discussion with some dude from the Civil Affairs Center about whether he's an information-related capability or not, okay? I'm just not. I get tired of it, you know, it gets old. It's the same, it, I mean, we beat the same ground every four or five years, you know, and it's all, it's not, has, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the good of the manual, is I got my rice bowl and I protected my rice bowl till I die. So that was kind of, that was kind of the thought behind it, I so, think. So, sir, you kind of indicated that relevant military capabilities might be leaving the draft as well. Yeah, so I think do you, so. To peek ahead, do you guys know how you're going to express this idea that there's so many different ways I to think interact we're just saying, with it? I think the way we're going is we're just going to say we conduct tasks, okay? Uh, how do we say we're doing that? Conduct tasks uh, in support of these activities, right? And and because we had, I think we had. What do we have? We had we had core, and then like rel. I can't remember the text. I don't think we had the draft. Yeah, yeah, we had activities and tasks underneath there. Um, and, and but when we describe capability, general. And yeah. And core. General and core. So like core was you know who we normally think of, and then general was like everybody else. And, and see, and one thing that on this related capability, and another thing we had a kind of a logic problem. So. We made this definition, it was a unit, a certain type of unit. I think that might be on the slide up there. But then you ask yourself, but soldier leader engagement is a, remember it was a IRC, right? Well, that's not a unit, right? And so those were the kind of issues that, but we still, soldier leader engagement is important. It's still important. It's just the logic, is, is that, you know, so that was another thing we are struggling with, was that logic. And the other, and the other kind of theme, I think, uh, with ADP is, uh, and we're still working on uh, potentially some principles of information, Army principles of information. They're they're not in these slides because uh, we don't know what they are yet. We're still kind of wading through that um, swamp. Um, but if if all soldiers matter, every soldier matters, right? So we talked about the cell phone. They don't know how it works, and it doesn't work. They call a SIGO. That's not the right answer necessarily. So when I came into the Army, I didn't call the SIGO. It was my responsibility to get in contact with my hired headquarters. And I was beat to death. And it wasn't my SIGO's fault if I couldn't talk. My fault. So I had to understand how the lower tactical network worked. Right? It was my job. Not the SIGO's job. Not my E4's job. My job as a platoon leader. It was my job. It was my section chief's job that howitzer couldn't get in contact with the FTC. Not the FTC's problem, their problem. Their problem to fix the radio. Their problem to get the, the right stuff working, right? So that driving that idea back into culture is very important. You use some of these tools, but you're also responsible for the maintenance of some of these tools. Right? There's specialists at these very high levels that enable satellites. I can't fix a satellite, right? But I need to know, understand the impact of you know, precision navigation and timing with threat capabilities and what's there or not, and if my device is being affected, right? 
all forces matter. Because the, the cyber person is not going to be there if I'm a squad leader and tell me my dagger's not working or whatever my tool is. I need to know if it's being spoofed. I need to understand if it's working or not. And they're not going to tell me. I need to know. Right? So this idea of all everybody matters is one of the reasons why this idea might not be right for the, for the ADP. And sir, you also kind of mentioned in your answer the magic word of culture. And so as we kind of end up, I think we're going to yeah. probably have to pause okay. here as we start to, to wrap up. But I did want to kind of open it up to some of those general questions. And I know that Shaq mentioned she wanted to bring that one up about culture as we, as we look to bring this kind of idea to such a large force like, like the Army is writ large. Uh, you had to write it down. I will just uh, I'll just jump jump into this. So again, this you're going to get Shaq's perception coming from a very Air Force information warfare that employed mission command extensively uh, for a 500 person squadron perspective. So that's where I come from. So when I say my my so my perspective is changing synonyms, going back and forth and what the ADP is over, I think you described a decade, probably longer within Sally, Sally White's paper, uh, which is beautifully written, right? Of course, because she, she does. Um, uh, but what we don't have, we can have dot mil PFP changes, but we don't have the dot mil PFP text C, where C equals culture. Because you're constantly, we, the Army, is constantly going to have those uh, problems unless the culture's actually changed and we employ mission command. And, uh, and you know, going back to anything that we do within the information IRCs, a plethora of them, they're growing apparently, is you want to change human behavior. We do everything we do to evoke a change of human behavior or physical destruction of something to achieve what is Klaus Witt's, the will, the you know, political will that will bring war to an end. Got it. But how do, how do the things that you're, we are putting in the ADP will change human behavior throughout the army? And then how do we work backwards to do integration amongst all of these concepts? The one that I would like to see the most is the employment of mission command. And even, sir, uh, using your example of we're not gonna have, um, information as a war fighting function because the army is very top down driven it's a perfect example of the culture of the army uh, because in the air force i my perception is when we went into information work there's a lot of ideas that came up that informed decision makers to make the change over sir so i had a couple thoughts while you're talking right you know this whole change the culture thing that, you know, we've said for years we want, we want to be an information army. You know, we want to be an information age army. But again, when it comes down to making money decisions, what do we spend our money on, okay? I think that's, you know, we buy ABCTs and we buy IBCTs and we buy strategic long, well, I guess that's dead now, but we buy ERC Alpha and some of the other things that we're buying. Uh, you know, we don't buy the stuff I think we need to make us an information age army. Uh, you know, the only way you change culture is to demonstrate the value, as far as I'm concerned. And the way we demonstrate value, I think, in the Army is during our training, okay, our leader development training, leader development uh, and education training. Uh, and until these things, you know, we're able to replicate it, uh, you know, we, and people are forced to uh, integrate this into operation and, and you know, it's, got, it's part of their plan. And again, we're changing, you know, we came up with a scheme of information in the new order format. You know, we've made I of Met TC, parenthetical I, you know, variable of Met TC uh, to get people thinking about this again. Uh, but until leadership starts paying attention, it's an AAR comment. Uh, all the things that we're doing show their value out there, okay, in during training uh, or during operations. And it, it's got, it can't be. I get you, it can't be a 17 month effect. You know, it's, it's like God bless cyber, you know, but, and they, but they pitch tactical cyber all the time, but the minute they tell you it's gonna take four months to get anything done, I just walk away, because you're not helping, you're not doing me any good as a brigade or even a division commander, I would say, okay? So, so we need to be able to replicate it, we need to train to it, and there needs to be immediate feedback as to whether we did it right or we did it wrong. 
Yeah, I do not know what goes on at the DIRT CTCs these days. I know when we were doing MREs and MRXs for Kosovo and Bosnia, a big part of that was soldier was was uh, uh, engagement, right? You know, information engagement, and they had great role players, and you'd have translator or uh, ter you know translators and and uh, interpreters, and uh, you know, a big part of it was meeting with these the commander, meeting with these people every day, and based on those discussions, you have you would get immediate feedback in the sim. Or, or is a you know white card event. I know that a measles event is not optimal, but it's better than nothing. Uh, and until they start forcing some of this, you know, during training events, I don't think it's ever going to be like accepted culturally. Okay, it's just not. Uh, you know, artillerymen. I'm an artilleryman by background. When you do a warfighter, if you have not stood up the FSC a week prior and have all your noms submitted, you know, at the 72-hour mark. Uh, prior to them turning that machine on, when they turn that machine on, you get zero, okay? You've got to have done that legwork. I would submit the plan needs to be done. Somebody needs to take a look at that and say, I mean, this is, you're talking, like, this is huge change, really, if you really want this to happen, you know, across the .NET OPF. Uh, you know, they're going to have to change training facility, how they train. They're going to have to change scenarios. They're going to have to look at the OC packages they have. They're going to look at how they you know, who they bring in for specialists or for role players on some of this stuff. I mean, it's, it's a significant cultural change. You're right. Um, you know, and what I'm talking is just stuff that I've seen work in the past. Uh, I don't know if that's what they're planning on doing right now because I've kind of dropped off these Tuesday meetings uh, because they talk an awful lot about governance these days, and that kind of is not my thing. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, Anybody, did I, anybody got anything? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I just maybe echo what you said a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it, it will be accepted or inculcated into the culture when soldiers see value in this approach. Um, but they have to understand what we're talking about. It has to be simple enough. They get it. And then they have to be able to think through how they're going to do these things and what they need to do to help achieve this, this condition that we're trying to achieve. Um, and the more buy-in uh, that you can get to that, the more value that they can see in terms of mission accomplishment or survivability or whatever the various benefits there are to them, um, I think the m more uh, buy-in you'll get. Um, also, I would say that the less the less we can, we can tie these fundamental doctrinal principles, um, if, if, it's, if it's operations or if it's information or whatever it might be, the less we can tie those things to specific capabilities or technology, I think the better we'll be. If you base your, your fundamental doctrine on specific technologies, you're going to run into a problem because every single time someone invents something, now you've got to reshuffle your doctrinal deck. So if we, if we make this fundamental enough, you know, the principles of war still work. And there's a reason why, because they're, they're, they're fundamental to how we can conduct this larger thing called warfare. Um, but if we, if we let ourselves get trapped by specific capabilities or specific technologies, it becomes less relevant. Uh, to lots of people because not everybody has those technologies or whatever. So the doctrine, I think, in Jesse's opinion, needs to be um, something that the force can understand. They can get a, their, sink their teeth into it. They understand it. Um, it's simple enough. Um, they can see an advantage to taking these, uh, this approach um, with the stuff that they have, uh, not the stuff necessarily that they don't have. So unfortunately, I think we're, we're losing the room soon and we've already gone over a little bit. So I just want to thank um, thank you guys for being panel members for this. Um, I know the, the conversation was good and I hate to cut it off. Um, so I think as we continue this dialogue, I think a lot of us are willing to, to continue engaging with you. Um, and it's really great to see kind of a peek behind the curtain of this process, especially as, like I mentioned, this was our very first task kind of as scholars to see the evolution that 
some of our inputs probably provided um, was great to see. So thank you again um, for joining us and hopefully everybody. Hey, gentlemen, I just, again, to kind of dovetail on to citizens and keep, you know, um, it takes a lot to go ahead and, and do this. And I wish there were in some respects more folks, but at the same time, I also feel like you're talking among family. Um, yeah. One of the things is that you're part of this network, whether you realize it or not, and we're part of your network. Um, they are vested. All of these officers are vested in this, not only just from an Army standpoint, but from a Joint Force standpoint. So please do not take the tone or anything else as being anything but you know, wanting to engage and be engaged. And the fact that um, I, I share the same observation in terms of looking at just the difference in a few months. And it's a, it's a credit to you all to have gotten not only the comments and are binning this and are grappling with this, but also are articulating it in such a way that's, I mean, I think you're moving very quickly and deliberately in the right direction. And whatever this little group can do to help as well, not only in just <laughs> providing CRM comments, but really in terms of what we're engaging leaders and we're kind of talking this stuff up because I think that, again, um, different strategies in terms of how does this meet with troopers, how does this get to the people who are the mid-grade future leaders, and then the actual leaders who are out there. And so um, we're incredibly grateful for your time and your effort as well as uh, being willing to engage in the intellectual knife fight. So thank you. Oh, sir, thank you. You know, appreciate the invite over here. I appreciate everybody looking at stuff. and. And I know I've talked to a couple of you on your on your theses, you know, and Mr. Creed worked with you and he appreciates that. And, you know, we we do keep a fairly open dialogue on stuff. And, you know, I don't know how any of this going to end, quite frankly. Okay? I couldn't tell you if you're holding a gun in my head. And all I know is I'll be happy when it's over. <laughs> and, but but it's probably, probably a year out, I would imagine. Maybe not that much. Maybe maybe closer to seven or eight months. But. And, but I'm thinking like February, March time frame. Don't tell anybody that, okay, because the party line is November. And, but FM30 got kicked, okay, to October. So and, and my charter was six months after FM30, so I got a little bit of wiggle room. And, uh, you know, I, we think we're doing something good for the Army. You know, you, you, Mr. Rim knows how to get in touch with any of us, you know, if you want to reach out. I would not recommend you read what we have now. I'd recommend you wait. <laughs> Don't read it. Yeah, you'd recommend you wait until the next draft, yeah. right? And Pete will get it to you, and we make sure he gets it. And, and uh, you know, it's just the process. This is like sausage making, and it gets pretty ugly sometimes. So, and you're like you guys, what the first or second class IA scholars going out there? First, right? Yeah. So like you're inaugurated, you know. So who knows? Who knows what you're going to see when you go out there? You may walk up there and you're going to go, "You did what during CGSC?" You know. Here, write me the scheme of maneuver. I want you to write my concept operation. But anyway, I really appreciate it. Yep. You know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.